We call this story the Transfiguration, and the church has celebrated it for uh, like centuries and centuries on August 6th, and so we've been thinking about it all week. And of course, the world knows August 6th as the day when America bombed uh, Hiroshima with nuclear weapons. But these weeks here in the Vine, we're talking about spiritual life, spiritual practice, spirituality, how, how to not just say it, but to live it. And so um, I, th this is kind of cartoony, but um, I think there are two big approaches, and I'm going to suggest that we hold them both in some kind of balance. But the first approach I talk about seems to have had the upper hand for a long time. And tell me what you think. So one approach or one outlook to this, how do we live a, a full human life, a, sp a full spiritual life, the, the God life in our human lives, is has an atmosphere of kind of a lingering sense of falling short, uh, of guilt, of shame for things we've done, or of not being good enough. And um, in this outlook, in this approach, um, everywhere you turn, there's something ready to pull me down. There's food, there's sex, there's jealousy, there's getting high, or there's resenting someone else's success. And life, if you have this outlook, life is a minefield of danger and sin and temptation and God knows what. And so you've got to step carefully through your life so as not to fall into one of these traps. And uh, in this outlook, even the human heart is kind of like that. There are these, these dark spots that have to be rooted out, this evil, this sin, these bad thoughts, whatever. Um, so we've got to constantly be on guard. We're always sorry, and we're suspicious. And um, uh, we've got to starve the beast. This is a, a, a life, really, of exorcism. You're always trying to cast out evil or root out evil. And um, uh, we might imagine or feel that God is pretty unhappy with us most of the time. And, and we might find ourselves requiring God in our life. We require God as the only way we can be saved from ourselves. We might require a God who is so good and so just that nothing we can do can ever satisfy that God or make things right. We might require a God who can only be satisfied if some perfect life, some perfect offering, both human and divine, were taken and offered as a payment, as a ransom, as a payoff, uh, a bail bond to save us. And... Um, of course, we've assigned that role to Jesus in, in this outlook. In this outlook, we require God not to really see us, but to kind of put the blood of Christ between us and God so God doesn't see what a mess I am. This spiritual path requires us to be constantly on guard, to be perpetually sorry and suspicious, and to root out evil desires within and without. Sin is everywhere, and if we didn't do it, we're surely implicated. And that requires God to hear and forgive again and again. Now, a lot of this is real and true. I fall short every day. I disappoint myself, I disappoint others, every day by my selfishness and lack of consideration. And in my crazy times of forgetting everyone but me, of doing things I know will not benefit me or anyone else and in fact will be hurtful. It's healthy for me to be honest, to own up to it, to look at it, to name it, it's sin, and then put it aside calmly and quietly. So that's one part of the spiritual life. And here's a pro tip. So you're not doing this all day and all night long. Do it twice a day. Do it before lunch 
and say, okay, how'd the morning go? Uh, I, could, uh, I was kind of nasty to the Lyft driver. I shouldn't have done that. And, you know, and I forgot somebody at work and blah, blah, blah. So you take stock at before lunch and then do it before bed and then put it aside quietly. Tomorrow, I hope I'll do better. Um, say sorry to God, sorry to the universe. If necessary, plan to say sorry to a particular person and make up your mind to try to do better. Now, for many people and for most of the church, I think, this is pretty much the whole spiritual life. It, it, and it works in a way. It can work okay. It can actually help you feel good and actually help you be a better person. Just watch your step and stay on guard. Now, there's another outlook in our tradition and it's an added dimension to this one. And unfortunately, this one has always overshadowed this other one. So tonight, let's look at this other one. You still have to watch your step, but you have to take off your shoes because your life is sacred. It's holy ground. No one has your life but you, and it was a gift given by God. So that's a starting point. There is divinity just beneath the surface of our lives, under every event, behind every face, behind every challenge, around every corner, the birds, the skies, how great thou art. Divinity is everywhere, but not always apparent. It's just on the edge of our peripheral vision. Um, it's really present, but it's not always directly seen or felt. And every once in a while, some strong signal, some four-bar connection from heaven or the universe or the divine heart comes through our eye into our heart and then shoots back to eternity. There's some connection. There's some, some glimpse, some taste some glint, some glance, some hint, some flash or glow of glory. Peter, James, and John experienced it for a few moments. It was bright, it was hopeful, it was resonant, it was fragrant, it was nearly terrifying but mostly reassuring and calming. These things happen to us, they're hard to capture or analyze, but they're real. Our lives, with all our mistakes and regrets, are just tinged with luminosity that's just, sometimes just out of our field of vision. And suddenly we experience not so much a hopeless, desperate requiring of God but a thirst and a pull desiring God. And in the desire, in the very desire, there's a corresponding refreshment and replenishment that begins to come. A spring of living water gushing up from our heels to our scalp and leading us into a new way of being in the world. It fills every vein and vessel of our life it can be nourishing, soothing, vitalizing. Our heart, our mind, our determination, our capacity for wonder, our readiness to do, serve, respond, all these things are nourished. And a readiness to be transfigured, to be changed, not just rooting out the blackheads and pimples, but to be changed be transfigured even while we remain ourselves because we've all let ourselves get a bit disfigured by our bad behavior and usually just our fear we're a little curved in and lastly this desire is fantastic it's more than just requiring God it's this desire we suddenly discover it's mutual 
God's desiring us. God's delighting in us. God wants to live in us. God wants to reveal God's mercy and heart and goodness and generosity and power in us. Wants us not just to gaze at, but to participate in, to share in divinity. Now in our lives, on our paths now, the spiritual path and practice then is to adjust our vision and our hearing and to gently polish the mirror of the soul. Don't dig at that, just polish it. So the divine light can reflect in and out from us. These are all metaphors, but you get what I'm saying. And to make a little more room for the God life to flower in us. It's being less cautious and guarded and suspicious and controlling and much more grateful, appreciative, nourishing. Now both outlooks, both stances can work together. But tonight we want to embrace the life of transfiguration since the first outlook has kind of eclipsed it often. Tonight we, we want to see what it's like, what it would we feel like to really let the divine power change us instead of just a cosmetic remake. And here in our tradition, we have a big tangible sign which was given by Jesus himself of our transfiguration, of our participating, of our sharing in divine life. And the sign of this sacrament, which isn't a thing, it's an event, the sign of the gathering, the sign of the story, the sign of the song, the sign of the gift, the sign of the sip and the taste, and the sign of the sending. Here we are desired. Here we're delighted in. Here we're made to shine again. Here we're nourished and fed and enlivened. The bread and wine are changed and get ready. We're changed along with them, if we'll accept it. On the way in, we sang, Holy, there is no one like you. There is none besides you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in love to those around me. Where will our transfigured selves show up this week?